I always tell people that back in the day, the only people that had orchid businesses were wealthy people you know, Sam Mosier, who owns Signal Oil Company or movie stars. And what you can buy at Trader Joe's now for 12 or 15 or $17, literally sold for hundreds of dollars, even back 40 years ago when I was into this. You know, nice big white phalaenopsis would easily sell for 80 or 90 bucks. What if you had spent over 40 years in the world of horticulture? What would that look like? What stories would you have? Well, today we have John Clements on the show. He's the director of gardens at my local botanic garden, the San Diego Botanic Garden, which I've been up to a bunch of times. And if you're a longtime viewer of our YouTube channel, you've probably seen John in our World of Houseplants tour that we did with him. So, John, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. Kind of curious, like, just let's rewind all the way back to the start. Like, how did it begin for you? It really began when I was a kid. And uh, the first time that I had been into a, a proper orchid greenhouse, I was maybe five or six years old. And it was sort of a, a dismal, rainy day. And you walk into this magical space where you, know, you saw some of those Cattleya orchids when we were in the conservatory. And these big, purple, beautiful flowers with this big, frilly lip. And the thing that I can remember just indelibly etched into my mind is the fragrance. I never smelled mm -hmm. anything like that before. And I was hooked. I mean, literally from the time I'm five or six years old, I'm a plant nerd. And so, you know, I got a few little orchids, but I also really got interested in a whole lot of other plants. And what I found was that plant people also love to share their knowledge. Wow. I wish it was that way for me. I think I was, you could see early signs I would be hooked on plants, I suppose, where I was into collecting bugs and rocks and gemstones and tumbling them and that sort of thing. For some reason, the plants never hit me until later in life, but nevertheless, here we both are talking to one another. How, how did this become a an actual career path for you? From the time I was about 10, 11, I was doing the neighbor's gardens. So mm. I was mowing and, and maintaining uh, probably four neighbors. You make good money. And so I was yeah. really starting from the time I was literally in elementary school as kind of a gardener. And from then on, it just got bigger and better. When I was freshly graduated from high school, I did my first professional soccer game as a linesman in the North American Soccer League. And I made more money and I kept saving wow. my money and I bought an orchid nursery when I'm 19 years old. So, you know, then, then it's like, wow, honey bar the door. You know, I'm really into the plant world at that point. I'm going deep, going yeah. really deep. So two questions. One, Back when you were 10 to 11, just out of curiosity, how much would it cost to have John Clemens do your yard? Uh, you could have the yard done for about five bucks. Five bucks, which I think <laughs> if you put that in today's dollars, I mean, that's like, what, 20, something like that? Yeah. Somewhere yeah. in that range. Yeah, Probably that's fair price. That. Yeah. And then when, when you got the orchid nursery when you were 19, how much does it cost to buy an orchid nursery? A uh, fair amount. And yeah. I, I went in, I bought one section of it completely outright. And then I went into partnership with somebody else for some more larger areas. And, uh, you know, I, I just saved a pretty nice little sum of money from that time by the time I was 19 and bought in. My parents thought I was crazy, but mm. it was fun though. And how long were you running the orchid nursery? Anything cool come uh, up in that time? Un until the early eighties. And really mm. the handwriting was on the wall. I always tell people orchids are fabulous. I really enjoy them, but it's very tough to make a good living at selling orchids. At that time, even the really big orchid growers were getting out of the business. You know, fuel costs are a lot. Uh, the, the utilities kill you. Land costs in Southern California. You know what that's like. You, you, you know, people, nurseries are then, disappearing yeah. all over the place and they turn into McMansions. They just subdivide. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Epic gardening should have been around, and then people could make more money. Get, get all that marketing know-how. There you go. Epic orchids coming soon. There you go. John and Kevin collaborating on a new business <laughs> venture. <laughs> so orchids obviously wasn't the only thing you've done, because I remember we talked when I was up for the World of Houseplants exhibit, and you had some stories about cultivating, I believe it was the Rex begonia, right? Oh, yeah. We did you know a lot of really cool begonias back in those days. One of the things that uh, I tell people is become a really good generalist when it comes to plants with a few brilliant areas of specificity. 
you know, and so that's kind of what I do. I, I, I can basically do anything in this botanic garden, but then mm -hmm. I'll have certain areas where I really specialize and really enjoy it. So the orchids, um, you know, bromeliads are a thing I like too. I mean, you're, you're certainly much more experienced than me in the world of plants, but what I've noticed at least in my 10 years is once you understand the fundamentals of, you know, the morphology of plants and how they grow and the different ways they reproduce and divide, et cetera, you can infer a lot of care and, and, and skill sets across different families of plants. And yeah, you're not perfectly right. Like the deeper you go, let's say into, I don't know, tomatoes, the, the more bespoke your care will, will become. But, um, the rest, you know, you could do a passable job at some things that you might not have deep experience with. For me, it was like a, a big thing because I've always been a Martha Stewart fan. And, and uh, I consulted on an article for Martha Stewart Living recently. And I thought, OK, I've arrived. I've made it. You know, I get to chat with Martha Stewart. That, that was a big thing. But mm -hmm. the thing I, I said there and I say to people frequently is make sure that you really are hitting what's local to you because there's this nationwide sense people love plants and things, but every part of the country has its own identity in terms of what grows there, what's easy, what's not. And to really look up the different garden groups in town, the clubs, you know, the Bromeliad mm -hmm. Society, the Orchid Society, there's a Fern Society, you know, Walter Anderson Sr. Jr., who's now in his mid 80s. He's just brilliant on platycerians and things. And so mm -hmm. if you go to these shows or, or the Cactus and Succulent Society, you get to touch all these plants with the hardcore fanatics about these things. Mm -hmm. And you can learn so much from these folks. They want to educate you. They want to share plants with you. That's what I've noticed, John, is I don't know what it is about the plant world compared to maybe other industries like, I don't know, take fitness or something like that, where sometimes that could be a little more protective. But in plants, it seems like all of us are more than happy to share more or less anything that anyone might might ask us. And I think part of that is some of these plants, you know, I was talking to a guy once who he took 20 years to breed a potato to grow from seed. I've talked to folks that have obviously developed new tomato varieties. It takes them a significant chunk of their life. Uh, so, you know, you, you kind of want to share what you're doing if you're spending 20 years on something. I don't know what it is. Maybe we're just friendly folks in general. Maybe we are, we're a little more, you know, Nice? I don't know. Yeah, plant people tend to be good people. So as we zoom out a little bit, John, from the world where you were, you know, in the orchid nursery, different houseplants you were raising, now, of course, you're the director of gardens at, at San Diego Botanic Garden, which is a fantastic botanic garden. How did you go from there to here? Well, it's interesting. The bulk of my career was really done. I, I, I from orchids, got into actually... Uh, manufacturing and selling greenhouses. You know, I know you just recently got a greenhouse too. And, oh yeah, mm -hmm. you know, having a greenhouse just ups the game for people. And, and it's really cool. And I used to uh, sell really high quality redwood greenhouses with glass. I mean, me, most people don't get greenhouses like that anymore. And I sold a greenhouse to Johnny Carson, you know, which when I was a kid, Johnny Carson was the be all and end all. He and, was, I mean, Johnny Carson, for those listening who might not know the name and the only reason i say that is because molly on our team who's on on the younger side she had no clue who johnny carson was and so i was like think about you know in my world it might be like carson daly from total request on mtv or something these days it'd be like a jimmy fallon type of character oh yeah yeah he was big when i was a kid bigger bigger oh, yeah. honestly Just yeah. huge and uh he was a chain smoker and i can remember that uh, one of the things i had to tell him was uh, mr carson don't smoke around the orchids. And he looks at me and like, what? What did you say? And I said, no, you, you really can't smoke around the orchids. The smoke's not good for them. Plus also you can spread tobacco mosaic virus to your orchids. And mm -hmm. he just kind of gives me a look, but he did what I said. He did it. <laughs> he, he, he did put, it. He yeah. put out the cigarette to save the plants, you know? And so I went from that to doing basically landscape maintenance on a big, big mm -hmm. scale. And we did estates, we did lots of uh, sports stars and people like that. Business grew, and I did that for a long, long time. And then I segued out of that. I actually became a minister for a while. I got a master's, oh, no way. Yeah, a master's degree of divinity and, and systematic theology. And I kept some of my wealthy clients on the side because you don't make much money as a minister. And so I no, had no, yeah. a couple billionaires I worked for, and they write me a big check, and I could do that. And... I got back into the plant world a little more intensely and this job opened up 
at the Botanic Garden. And my friend Nan Sturman and a few other friends said, John, you'd be perfect for this job. You ought to go apply. Mm. So that's what I did. And so here I am now. I've been here four years and yeah. I love it. It's just, yeah. if you've ever had a job where you feel like it's tailor made for you, it, it felt truly as though the position and my skill set just meshed like this. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, obviously it's a botanic garden, right? So there's like a, a how many species of plants there? Th- thousands, right? Oh my right? goodness, we have like six thousand species, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the more impressive ones I've I've personally seen. And so, for someone like yourself, it just feels like the dream job, right? It really is. It's you know, I enjoy coming to work every single day. I look forward yeah. to it. But John, after seeing the world of orchids exhibit, I, I really want to get into them. And and now I have a greenhouse, right? So I think I have a little bit more capability to grow them. So for those of us who have never really gotten into them at all. Do you mind just starting us off with a primer on what makes them so special? Well, I think one of the things that makes orchids really special is that they do have this legacy of rarity. You know, these were plants that were grown by wealthy, wealthy people. You know, it would be the DuPonts. It would be royalty. People that were, you know, movers and shakers had these plants. Nobody else could afford them. And really now you and I can have plants that were previously unobtainable. And, and so there is this mystique that goes along with orchids. And, and they are cool. The nice thing about many kinds of orchids is that you can have a plant that can be in bloom for months at a time. You know, a phalaenopsis or a cymbidium, they really last a long time. And, and so... You have that mystique factor. You have the fact that they're just flat out beautiful and that they can have a really extended bloom period. And that's one of the things I like about them. I think what's so interesting to me is that bloom period, because certainly in the edible garden world, you're not getting a bloom lasting that long at all. And if you are, it's probably because it's going to be forming a fruit behind it and off you go to the kitchen. Is it okay if I wanted to get started? Can I just go to Trader Joe's or, or is that not a great place to source them? Trader Joe's is a great place to get orchids. You know, just a little background on Phalaenopsis, which if you go to the Trader Joe's, 90% of the orchids you're going to see there are Phalaenopsis. I always tell people that back in the day, the only people that had orchid businesses were wealthy people. You know, Sam Mosier, who owns Signal Oil Company or movie stars. And what you can buy at Trader Joe's now for 12 or 15 or $17 literally sold for hundreds of dollars even back 40 years ago when I was into this. A nice big white phalaenopsis would easily sell for 80 or 90 bucks. And I go to Trader Joe's. I mean, Kevin, I walk into Trader Joe's. I feel like they're giving me a door prize. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm, welcome mm -hmm. to Trader Joe's. Have an orchid. They're so cheap. I don't Mm -hmm. even know how they're doing it so inexpensively. But, you know, for eight or 10 or 15 dollars to buy a plant, take it home and have it be in bloom for several months, that's a win-win. It's fabulous. And so, yeah, it's a great place to start. They're inexpensive, mm-hmm. they're, they're gonna be great orchids. So if I roll up to Trader Joe's and, and buy an orchid, and then maybe I get into it and I wanna source them, maybe more rare varieties or, or, or different, different species or, or whatever, where would the next tier up be for shopping? Well, the next level would be that you can in, in whatever area people are in, there's probably some orchid nursery uh, nearby that you could find some very interesting plants at. And, or locally in San Diego, Cal Pacific orchids uh, up uh, in Lucadia is fabulous. Andes orchids, there's mm. um, Sunset Valley orchids in Vista. So there are places you can get plants pretty inexpensively and they're really fabulous. The other thing I recommend to people is to go to your local orchid society meeting. Typically, every orchid society will have a primer at the beginning of the society meeting, maybe a half hour or an hour class on culture of orchids. And that will expand the palette and also give you a lot of information. And the other thing that I love about orchid society meetings is there's always a raffle table. So oh, there you, go. you get raffle tickets. When I would attend the orchid show meetings or the society meetings, it was rare that I would not walk out of there with at least one plant. You know, you mm-hmm. win the raffle, you maybe get another plant, somebody shares plants. And so that way you get exposed to more and more 
quality material and stuff that you won't see someplace else. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I might have to start. You might see me around <laughs> up in North <laughs> County, just kind of popping around these nurseries. But okay, so now I've got a few, right? Mm -hmm. What do I need to know? I mean, I know that there's a few different types of ways that they, they traditionally like to grow. You get your terrestrial orchids, your epiphytic orchids, which I think is probably the, the most common that you'll see. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was litho, lithophytic, right? Where you That's grow true. on rocks. But aside from, aside from that, like, what do I just bare bones need to know about how to care for them properly? So if you want to raise them on a windowsill, they're pretty easy. You, you want to make sure that the light's not so direct that it will burn. But at, at my house, uh, we have a nice Western exposure. Uh, it's on the side of the house where there's another house in the way. So it's very bright light, but it's not intense direct sun. Uh, a good Eastern exposure is great. Put them on a windowsill and you could put a little tray with some gravel under it. So they like a little extra atmospheric humidity. The thing is that it's much more difficult to raise orchids if you have them mounted. Um, that's really greenhouse growing. If you've got them mounted on oak slabs or pieces of wood, that's a little trickier. They want higher temperatures. They want higher humidity. But on yeah. a windowsill, you can really do pretty well. One of the maybe uh, an indicator plants of success would be also if you can raise African violets which a lot of people do. I love African violets. I think they're so rewarding and so beautiful. If you can do that plant well, you could equally grow uh, a phalaenopsis or, or another type of orchid. Yeah, I think what I noticed at the exhibit was that some, some of them you do have mounted on that wall. And of course, it's in a big greenhouse. So mm -hmm. like you said, that's probably applicable in that situation. But all the other ones or most of the other ones are in pots but those pots aren't necessarily full of true soil. It's more of a sort of a soil free mix. So you're still sort of growing it in an epiphytic fashion, but you're just containing it in a pot because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, John, but it seems like you're just crafting that environment a little with a little bit more buffer than it would normally be so that you don't necessarily have to grow it in a greenhouse. And it seems like when most people kill orchids, um, they're, they're either not putting it next to the windowsill giving it enough light or they're not um, sort of respecting the way in which it wants to grow from the roots down. Right. If you take an orchid out of a pot and, and just inspect them, the roots are very thick and very fleshy. Uh, they're really meant to adhere. Most epiphytic orchids, orchids anyway, they are meant to adhere to trees. And so what we're doing is we're taking that environment and we're taking basically what was on the outside of that tree, which is bark. And most mixes for orchids are made of bark uh, along with some type of very chunky perlite or maybe pumice. Some people will grow them in a, a product called LECA, light expanded clay aggregate, which a lot of people use for hydroponics. Right. You could raise orchids in just the LECA if you wanted to. But one of the things that people fail at too is, is they need a lot of light they want a little bit of high humidity. They don't want to be in the typical houseplant soil or soil of any mm -hmm. kind. They really want that, you know, either coconut coir. They want to be in uh, pumice, something that drains really well and gets lots of air. Remember, if an orchid's on the side of a tree, what does it have it around it all the time? It has a lot of air. And so you don't want to have a, a heavy mix. The other thing that most people fail at is that they really don't feed them enough. So you have to fertilize. Uh, and I like to use a method that I call weekly, weekly. So do a dilute concentration yep. of fertilizer. But the thing is, too, because that mix is so porous, everything runs right through it. And so you don't have a lot of retention of that fertilizer on the plant or in the media. And so if you do a dilute concentration, maybe once every seven to 10 days at like a quarter strength, the orchid's getting a nice dilution on a regular basis yeah the weekly weekly i think was the most clever was a clever turn of phrase for sure makes it easy to remember but also just a clever approach because i learned that from you when we we're at the houseplant exhibit so not the orchid exhibit and you were you were saying for the most part that's how you approach general houseplant care as well instead of like these big batches of fertilizing that people might decide to do on their whole houseplant jungle i was going to ask there's probably a, a myth or a technique you've probably heard about with orchids, which is which is the ice cubes. 
right? Um, I don't know where this came from. Maybe you do. You're, you're much deeper in the game than I am. But is there validity to something like that? Or should we just chill out and care for them in a normal fashion? No, ice cubes are not helpful at all. Um, well, <laughs> I don't know where this myth came from, but it's wrong on a couple of levels. Uh, for one, if your ice cubes are made from tap water and your tap water is San Diego, dreadful, salty, high in dissolved solids water, it's the same going into the freezer as it is coming out of the freezer, whether it's ice or whether it's water. And if you're putting that on your plant, it's still crummy water. So it's really not helpful. Some of that chloramine can be diminished by, by using it as an ice cube. But the other thing is there orchids grow in every single continent in the world, except for Antarctica. And so, yeah, you yeah. know, putting ice on roots of plants from the jungle is not a very smart idea. I, I couldn't imagine, right? It's like, well, just think about it. Like when would water that cold, so basically barely above freezing since it's melting and going straight down, when would that ever impact the roots of an orchid in, in the wild? Literally never. Uh, I can't think of one example. Uh, maybe some freak storm in, with which it probably would kill the orchid if that was the case, right? Right. Uh, and so any, any other weird orchid care things that you've heard of in your time that you're like, that's just totally wrong? Oh, sure. I mean, sometimes you'll you'll get people that will put coffee grounds on things, which, you know, even in your vegetable garden, coffee grounds aren't going to make much of a difference. But with orchids, it's not a good idea. You do get a certain amount of acidification from coffee grounds. But the thing is, you're then putting this very dense material again on orchid roots that really want a lot of air and a lot of um, ability to drain. And so then you're sort of confounding that. There's something about the allure of a plant, I think, or if, if it seems more rare or more unique or special in some way, where I, what I've noticed at least is the care guides for that, those plants tend to get more ornate as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, maybe it's just, hey, again, go back to the basics. Where did this plant evolve? Give it environmental conditions and fertilizer, et cetera, that just matches where it evolved. Uh, and then just pull back and, and relax and enjoy the beauty of the plant. Right. You know, one thing that we spoke about when we did the tour with the house plants too, is that if you find that there's a particular spot in your house where it's not working, one part of the greenhouse is not very suitable for plants. And, and you know, it, it's like, we'll we'll put an orchid there and then we'll discover, you know, it's really not thriving. It doesn't like this spot. We'll move it 20 feet someplace else and suddenly it turns on. So don't be afraid to move things around in your house. If you find that it, a plant's not thriving, maybe it needs more light or maybe it needs a little more air circulation. And so don't be afraid to move things around until you find that happy spot. Yeah, that's something I learned from you as well on that tour that I think was a very good call. Just experiment, just test things out and you might find that a different spot, all of a sudden it magically thrives. And I'm really curious, since you are quite literally directing an entire botanic garden, you know, what, what does someone need to know about water quality? As we all know, we can't survive without water and certainly our plants can't survive without water. And water is really the single biggest factor that affects raising plants. And so some places in the country, they have fabulous water. I was just in Central Coast last two, couple of weeks. And from Los Angeles northward, they have a completely different water supply than we do in San Diego. And I was in Carmel and the water coming out of the shower was soft and wonderful. And I'm thinking, man, this is like beautiful, pure water. And then I come to take a shower in San Diego and it's full of dissolved solids. It's very hard. It's salty. It's, it's really not great water. And so the water you use on your plants will affect the plant's growth. And, you know, I know you love the edible stuff. Well, my entire backyard is everything edibles. You know, the front yard's one thing, but the backyard is fruit trees and vegetable gardens. And I want to have good water on these things. And so what you'll discover in San Diego is our water is very salty. It comes from Colorado. It's really the Western part of the continental divide runs through Colorado. It goes through New Mexico and Arizona. And it's in that great basin that's picking up lots and lots of salt. 
and lots of dissolved solids. By the time it reaches us in San Diego, it's, it doesn't taste good. It's really high yeah. in salt and it's hard on the plants. I know from my hydroponic days, which is how I started gardening, you, you obviously will test your water before you add any nutrients into it. And I, I believe from a parts per million perspective, San Diego water at that time, at least was somewhere in the four to 500 parts per million of sort of non-water non H2O particles in there, which that's where you get into the calcium and the magnesium and, and some of these salts that, that you're talking about, which obviously have a lasting impact on, on the plants compared to how these plants would have, would have been watered in the wild, which is for the most part, just from, from rain or, you know, the flows of that rain over a landscape. Right. And a lot of people fail to realize too, they think, well, I'm on a well. And so I have this unlimited amount of water that's really great water. Well, that's not necessarily the case. You know, at the, gosh, if you were here back during the times of colonization when the Spanish were here, where the early 1900s and farming is just getting started here, you could literally in Mission Valley, you could hit groundwater at two feet in Mission Valley. In the El Cajon wow. Valley, you could dig a well and have water at 10 to 15 feet. Well, now people are going down a thousand feet, 2000 feet to get water. And what you'll find, you know, back in the day when there were a few thousand people living here, there's plenty of aquifer. There, there's a lot of water underground. But now the latest, the latest statistic I read in terms of numbers of wells in San Diego is at 75,000 wells. You have everybody tapping into that aquifer. And if you do a water test on your well, you'll also find your well is full of iron or it might have very high nitrate levels even. And a lot of that is because of the number of septic systems that are around. So well water is not quite the answer either. And, and so the water quality makes a huge difference on the plants. So it's a bit of a gloomy picture, I suppose, we're painting here is tap water, at least in this region, and obviously test your own region if you're listening, uh, well water. What are you guys doing at the Botanic Garden and is what you're doing actually feasible for someone like myself? Well, we have three different watering systems at the Botanic Garden. So we have for our conservatory, we actually have a very large, very robust reverse osmosis system. And then we have two 500 gallon tanks that we will produce very pure, very clean water. And we use that for the orchids and the aeroids and the really pristine tropical stuff that's there. Then we have plain potable tap water that everybody else has. And one of the things you'll find in, in if you raise cherimoya or if you raise mango or avocado, you'll find that after a season of irrigating, your leaves at the end of the season are just terrible. They're half brown. They're, they look dried and desiccated. That's because of the salts we have in our tap water. And we're always looking forward to rain to leach that away and, and basically clean that up. And then the third type of water we have here, we actually use recycled water on about 40% of the garden. And recycled water is probably the way everything will go in California over time because we have more people and less water all the time. And the thing with recycled water is if you think tap water's bad, recycled water's worse. It's far saltier. It has, in fact, more concentrations of dissolved mm. solids. So it's really tough to grow on. We find that we can even kill eucalyptus trees with it. Uh, wow. Young eucalyptus, if we spray on the foliage, it burns the foliage and they turn black and we'll have... It's that it's, salty. Wow. It's that salty. It's, it's really, really tough to grow plants with. We wow. find that if you use inline drip irrigation, that even sensitive plants, we can get to muddle along. They won't look pristine or really even good, but we can at least to a satisfactory level for us, we can keep them alive. But those really, that's going to be the way water works for everybody going forward. And that's going to be, you either have RO, you've got tap water or you have recycled. And so when it comes to my orchids or really sensitive house plants, I'm using RO here at the garden, but at home I have reverse osmosis under my sink too. So I'm mm -hmm. going to use that water for the sensitive stuff. If I don't have an RO filter, which I actually don't, I should think about it, but let's say I don't, right? Or someone listening does not and doesn't want to get one. What about running it through a Brita filter? What about using distilled? 
I, I'm throwing some options out there so that maybe someone can do something a little more accessible. Sure. Well, you can get these days a pretty nice under sink system. Uh, Costco had had them for maybe 300 bucks, 350 bucks, you know, and, and then you change the cartridges out maybe once a year. So that's a pretty darn nice solution. Uh, to do an under sink RO system. Certainly distilled water is great for the plants. If, you know, if you don't have the RO, definitely do that, but that gets expensive too. You know, it's buck and a half, two bucks a gallon for distilled water. If you just have tap water though, one of the things you can do is just make sure that you leach your plants on a regular basis. So, you know, maybe once a month, what I'll do, uh, what I used to do before I had RO, I'll take the plant and literally submerge it in a bucket. So I completely uh, cover the root ball and up into the top of the pot and soak it and then drain it away so that I'm getting all that salt draining away from it. So there are ways to mitigate it. Do you mind giving us a primer on the basic types of orchids and then maybe we get into a few of your favorites? Sure. No, I, man, I love to talk about orchids, Kevin. So yeah. let, let's <laughs> jump in. So let's do it. one of the things I, I really like is that with a few plants, you could conceivably have an orchid in bloom at your house every day of the year. So one of the, the tricks to that is make sure maybe about once a month you go and you buy an orchid in bloom. What's neat about that is that you're maybe going to spend 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks once a month, but the orchids will tend to bloom at the same time every year. So over time, if you do that, let's say every month, you had 12 plants, you could conceivably have some flowers in your home every month of the year, which, gosh, that's a nice thing to, to have that beauty in your home or maybe the fragrance. And so you can spread that bloom cycle too among different plants. So one of the easiest orchids, my goodness, this they used to be so popular and they've somewhat fallen out of fashion, but they're regaining some impetus now, but cymbidium orchids, and those can be raised outdoors. They prefer to be outdoors, actually. Sort of have grassy foliage, and they might get between 18 inches and maybe three or even four feet high, depending on the type, but they will have multiple bloom spikes. On the coast, they could grow almost in full sun, but the more inland you go, you'd, you'd have maybe dappled light um, so that they have very bright light or dappled light but they'll be in bloom for four to six weeks. So that's really an award winner. And they start blooming oftentimes in October, November, and they'll go through early spring. So again, that idea, if I bought an orchid in bloom every month, or mm -hmm. so, as one mm -hmm. fades out, I get another one. I buy one that's in bloom. After about a year cycle like that, you're going to have plenty of orchids in bloom. That's a clever way to do it. It's just continue buying ones in bloom. And then, yeah, after a year, you've got you've got a perfect sort of lineup. What about when we get into a specific variety someone could look for in a couple of these categories that are just absolute standouts to you? Well, if I could only have one orchid, uh, for me, I would want a zygopetalum. It is extremely easy to grow. In fact, that was one of the orchids when we did the tour together. It knocked both of our socks off. I mean, there was one that must have had 20 bloom spikes on it. Uh, and it's a really different color combination, which I love. It's kind of chartreuse with brown on, mm -hmm. on the petals and the sepals. And then the lip is either a deep, dark, kind of an indigo blue or even up through lavender purple. And the thing that's great, too, is they're all fragrant. I've never smelled a zygopetalum that's not fragrant. And so it's easy to grow. It's easy to get a very big specimen, but it has so many things going for it. And that'll grow on a windowsill. It'll also grow outside in Southern California. It could grow out with the cymbidiums and just do fine. So if I had just one, it would be a zygopetalum. Maybe another one that is very hard to find, but once you find it, it's easy to grow. It is super easy to grow. And that is an ancelia. There's Ancelia africana. It's from Africa. It's called the leopard orchid. And mm -hmm. it is yellow with brown spots. Again, pretty fragrant. But what's nice about that orchid is it has a different type of structure, has a very long pseudobulb, and then it has this sort of palmate foliage at the top. So that's one that looks great as a house plant uh, or just a plant outdoors. If it never had flowers, it would be very attractive. But just add a spike of 
flower is a foot or two high that smells good and, and it's brightly colored, hard to beat. Hard to beat. Yeah, I would say the zygopetalum that I had seen at the World of Orchids exhibit, and I saw a few, the scent was incredible. I do have to, I do agree with you completely. That was an incredible scent. And yeah, it was more of more, just more flowers, more smaller flowers from what I remember than let's say a Phalaenopsis, which is sort of that standard one you might see at a Trader Joe's. Um, I, I just, I guess I didn't really understand the breadth of sort of growth habits, flower structures, shape sizes, et cetera. Uh, and, and it really, really stood out to me. What would you say is the rarest orchid someone could pr possibly find, you know, bes barring, you know, a private collection type of thing, but like something really cool, something really bespoke that someone could actually get their hands on. Well, you know, that you could actually get your hands on that's pretty rare. Uh, I think Mazdavalias are really, really cool. They, they're kind of this uh, different shape. You liked those. I remember you, you kind of keyed on those and they're just a very, very cool shape. You know, then there are some really esoteric things, that, you know, Vandas, for instance, that, that are typically grown in Asia, Renantheras. Um, you know, they're super cool. They're tough because they're not going to grow well outdoors here. You'd need mm -hmm. a greenhouse and some orchids from the tropics. If it's uh, below 60 degrees, they are not happy. They're not going to grow. So what I try to do is steer people toward, you know, there's stuff you could get that's really cool if you had a greenhouse, but go for the stuff that's easy and grow for, you know, the things you can grow out on the porch or in the house on a bright window. Awesome. Well, some good orchids to start out with if you're just getting into the game. And like I said, you'll, you'll be seeing some orchids coming on the Epic Gardening channels pretty soon because I'm pretty excited about them, especially now that I have the greenhouse. So stay tuned, good luck in the garden, and keep on growing. Thank you.